Well, here's another demonstration of how we can use Gauss's law to answer an electrostatics question. I've actually pre-made a drawing here, so you might want to just pause this and grab a, a couple of pencils or pens. Uh, colors are helpful here to try to render your own diagram. And this is one that you, you don't want to try to make tiny. You want to take lots of space on your page and make it big enough that you're going to be able to label things on here. Because as you'll be able to tell when I'm done, there's a whole lot going on here. Not just equations, but things to label on the diagram, especially when we're trying to use the same diagram to answer multiple questions. Uh, if necessary, at some point, you might just stop and redraw an identical diagram. Uh, if your first one is all cluttered, then you can label more on your other one. This particular one starts with a uh, hollow shell. Now, this is a spherical shell. Remember, in two dimensions, it looks a whole lot like just a, a little ring, but we've got a picture of this in three dimensions. And inside the cavity of this shell is um, a small positive charge. I've made it a positive 3Q. I'm using a small case Q so I can differentiate it from a generic capital Q that, that our author uses as a symbol for charge. Um, and then the shell itself I rendered in blue to indicate that it has a net negative charge on it of minus 5Q. So those charges are not the number of coulombs. They're just relative charges. There's um, almost twice as much negative charge as there is positive charge. And of course, it's opposite in sign. Now, you might ponder for a little bit, well, how would you get a positive 3Q to just hover there in the middle of a cavity? Well, we don't tend to answer questions like that. These are a bit hypothetical. Um, but it's not particularly an important point when we're solving this particular problem. So I'm going to use some tricks here, and the tricks are all centered around Gauss's law. And the more you see these tricks, the more you get comfortable with using them in, in different uh, novel situations that you might see. So the first question here, how much charge is on each of the two surfaces of the shell, the inner and the outer? And um, what we're going to do here is we're going to start by uh, employing the symmetry of the situation. This obviously has spherical symmetry. And so we are going to draw a Gaussian surface. Now remember, when you draw a Gaussian surface, draw it a different color so that you can tell it's not a real physical part of the situation, but it's instead just a uh, kind of a pool that you use to describe what's going on. And we draw a, a shell that matches the the symmetry, so it's going to be concentric with all the other circles on the page. We're going to draw it dashed. And the one I need in particular here is actually right in the metal itself. So it doesn't matter exactly where it is. In fact, you see I'm not hitting all the marks perfectly. But that green dash line there is the outline of my Gaussian uh, sphere. So what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to use Gauss's law. And I'll just write out Gauss's law here, because the more you see it, the more comfortable you get using it. So Gauss's law says, in symbolic form, that the integral of e dot dA, remember what that means. It means the sum of a bunch of little numbers found by multiplying the strength of the electric field times the small little piece of area through which that electric field is piercing, and incorporating the angle between those two by using the cosine of the angle that they make with each other. All that, those little parts added together as a, a integral or, or a sum of an infinitesimally uh, small things, um, that's what we see here on the screen. And all that will always be equal to the total amount of charge inside that particular area that you used on the left, all divided by this constant known as epsilon sub naught. So you see how the left and right sides go together. We refer to a surface area on the left side by doing the integral, and we refer to the charge inside that surface area on the, the right side by writing Q sub n. OK, now we need to use a piece of logic. And that piece of logic says that we cannot have an electric field anywhere on that green circle. Because if you notice, we drew it inside the metal. And if there were to be um, an electric field inside a piece of metal, then we'd have charges moving all over the place, which would probably cause the metal to heat up, because that's what happens when 
when charges move through metal, and everything in the world would be getting hot just sort of spontaneously. So it completely defies logic. So we have to begin with the presumption that there is no electric field within the metal itself. What that means is we're going to be adding up a whole bunch of zeros here in Gauss's law because every little piece of area has a zero being multiplied by it. And we sum up all those zeros and we get zero. Now, what that means is that the charge inside that particular green area must also be zero. Well, let's look back at what we know. We can see there that we have positive three charge, a positive three Q on the, the inner part, the red part. Well, how can we have a net of zero then? Well, there's only one conclusion that we could make here. And I'm going to render these in, uh, in blue. And that means we have to have the same amount of negative charge on this surface here. I'm just going to shade it. Now, just because there's a magic number three here doesn't mean I'm drawing three things. I mean, this could be bazillions of electrons in this case, all evenly spread out, nice and symmetrical. There's no reason to think that we would collect a charge any more on the right side than on the left side or on the top versus the bottom. But the net indicated here with this blue must be minus 3 Q. So, minus 3 Q on the inner surface. Okay, now the outer surface is actually a little easier than this. We were told in the original part of the problem that the, the whole shell has a charge of minus 5. Well, now we know where minus 3 of that is. Well, where's the rest of it? It can't be within the metal itself because the, the charges always collect on one of the surfaces. That must mean the rest of it is on the outer surface. So if I've got minus 3 accounted for already and I need a total of minus 5, that must mean the other minus 2 Q is on the outer surface of the shell. I didn't really have to use any Gauss's law in that situation at all, but I'm going to shade this blue here just to give the indication that we've collected some negative charges there as well. Uh, certainly different amounts. Minus 3 on the inside, minus 2 on the outside. But we have to make sure that the total that we were given in the beginning is, is what we total up for the two surfaces. All right. Now, how strong is the electric field at those two points indicated there by A and B? Here again, we're going to employ Gauss's law. So I'm going to draw another Gaussian surface. This time, the Gaussian surface I need to answer question two must coincide with point A. So I'll draw, and I want you to draw as well. Anytime you do a Gauss's law demonstration of an electric field, draw a Gaussian surface. And we're given that this is a distance A. I ought to label it here because it wasn't labeled on my original diagram. You see again how we're getting awfully cluttered here. So if you've started over with a new diagram, I would suggest you just pause the video and make a new one. And then you, you don't have to worry about all the stuff we used uh, back in part one. And then we write Gauss's law again. You say, well, we just wrote it, didn't we? Yeah, well, we're going to write it again because we want to be thorough. And so if I can get the right color here. In part two, we'll write the sum of all the E dot DAs on that smaller sphere that I drew there is equal to that enclosed charge divided by epsilon sub naught. Keep in mind, we're not talking about the same sphere that we talked about in number one, so we can uh, just ignore that one. In this case, there's no reason to believe that the electric field is zero, and so we have to use the spherical symmetry as we've done with other spherical situations and say two important things. First, that the electric field must be the same at any point on that green Gaussian sphere. And so I don't really need to think of that as a variable as I go around there adding up all the little bits from all the little parts of area. And secondly, that the area vector is going to be outward and that's exactly along the same line that the electric field vector should be that's radiating out from the middle. So I don't need to worry about the vector directions either. So I can just write this as whatever that electric field is times the sum of all the little pieces of area around that small Gaussian sphere, which is 2 pi a squared. Remember, a is our radius for this sphere. 
Now, how much charge do we have inside there? Let's go back up to the picture. If you look just inside that small green dashed line, we're inside the cavity there, so it's only the positive 3Q charge that's in there. So that's what we're going to put in for the enclosed charge. And then epsilon sub naught, of course, goes along for the ride. And so if we solve this for E, we will get 3Q over 4 pi epsilon sub naught A squared. Put the epsilon sub naught there next to the 4 pi because those are the constants in the we we'll put the variable stuff in later. And notice what we have here. Just like Newton's shell theorem describes, that if we can treat all of the, the charge here as being concentrated at the center, which really it is, uh, it's a pretty small ball of charge that I drew there, and we completely ignore any charge that is outside of our particular region. In this case, all that negative charge on the shell itself does not come into play at all. It contributes nothing to the electric field at point A. However, at point B, when we go to answer question three, that's going to look a little different. So we again just write our generic form, kind of like writing a formula, if you will. I like to think of this as, as a concept. It's a tool. You might be tempted to call it a formula. You'll get over that the more you get used to using these things. And so we again have the same symmetry we had before, which means we can write the left side here is just E times the total surface area of a larger sphere. Now, I didn't draw it this time. So let's go back. And if we've got a little space here, or you've maybe created some more space on your page, we have yet another Gaussian sphere. I'll just draw a little part of it that fits on the screen. You see it wraps around right through point B. And this one has a radius of small b, because that's what was described in the original problem. So that's why we're using that for the surface area of that Gaussian sphere. Now, what do we have on the other side? How much charge is inside that big green sphere? Well, you see we've got a positive 3Q there in the middle. And we also include the shell this time because it's inside. So we've done minus 5Q there for a total of minus 2Q. And that goes over epsilon sub naught. And so when we isolate the E, we're going to have a minus 2Q over 4 pi epsilon sub naught B squared. And I purposely not reduce the 2 and the 4 down to 1 half. I just think I like to have the 4 pi epsilon sub naught down there so it is easy to compare with the previous one. If you look at the previous one, <clears throat> just by comparison, we have a plus Q here at point A, and we have a minus 2Q down at B. And really, um, of course, the distances are the uh, not the same either. But you see what goes there in the numerator ends up being just the charge enclosed by whatever Gaussian cylinder, or Gaussian sphere, rather, you're using for that particular part. And one last thing I'll mention here, and just kind of highlight this. There's a negative sign on this expression. And what exactly does that mean? Well, let's remember that we are describing a vector quantity here. We got a positive up here for point A, and we got a negative in point B. And with a vector, when we see a positive versus a negative, all that tells us is which direction it points. So if we go back up here, if somebody asked us to, to go one step beyond finding the expression and actually draw a vector, let me find a color that might uh, stand out here. What this means is that point A and every point at that same distance away, we would have an electric field value that would be radiating outward like that. But at point B, we would have an inward field. So the signs can, can certainly indicate something that we could also indicate by arrowhead directions. 
All right, I think this is a, enough for now as far as another application of Gauss's law, and we could certainly get more complicated this. I've seen shells within shells within shells, and you really employ the same kind of tactic in those cases. So don't shy away from new situations. Just think about how Gauss's law can be used and tweaked a little bit to, uh, to tackle whatever situation you have.